morning, everyone. We're delighted to have you back in this room with us. Um, so it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, our second keynote, um, Ethan Zuckerman, um, who's going to, uh, to uh, give us a really interesting talk. Um, and I think he's ready to make the slideshow available to you, so I'll, I'll upload it upload it on the um, shared folder later on. A couple of words about Ethan. He's the director of the MIT Center for Civic Media. He's the author of Rewired Digital Cosmopolitans in the Age of Connection. Um, you might know him for his recent work with Yokai Benkler uh, on the bribot led right-wing media ecosystem and how it altered the broader media agenda in the 2000. Uh, 16 uh, US elections. Um, he's also the author of the Cute Cat Theory of Digital Activism, uh, which is a very nice theory. Um, go on Wikipedia if you haven't heard of, of, of it. Um, you can read up on it there. Uh, he's got a great blog called My Heart in Accra. Um, and that's where my colleague uh, Marco Bassas and I discovered the term serial activism. Um, which we kind of borrowed and then tried to expand on conceptually. So it's really a, a great pleasure and, and an honor for us to have Ethan with us. Ethan, please take it away. Well, thank you so much, Dan, and um, thanks all for, for being here. I'm really looking forward to a chance to, well, to be perfectly frank, to, to try to recruit you to my cause. Um, and my cause is, is pretty simple. Um, in as much as this is a conversation about social movements and parties in a fractured media landscape, I'm all fractured media landscape. And what I want to try to persuade you is to think about that fractured media landscape in a particular way, which is as an ecosystem. Uh, and to think about it not just in terms of individual parts, but as sort of an organic whole. Uh, and the work that I've been doing for the last 10 years or so is trying to build tools to make it easier to study that landscape as a whole rather than as in individual parts. So um, this is a very straightforward recruitment talk. I'm hoping to win you over to my cause by the end of it. And at the very least, we can have arguments about whether this is or is not a good way to try to solve this set of problems. Uh, but here are the problems. Um, we are at a moment where there's a great deal of popular discourse about the idea that social media may be deeply unhealthy for us in one way, shape, or form. Uh, one of the ways I like to think about this is a way that my friend Jonathan Zittrain has put forward. Zittrain's argument was that for the first 20 plus years of the web, there was an assumption that this was great for democracy, that what this was going to do is make it possible for people whose voices weren't being heard to suddenly be heard by different audiences. And that what we needed to do was to work very hard to keep this medium as open and as free as possible. And then really in the last five to 10 years, there's been a pushback in the other direction, which is this paradigm of public health. Um, maybe certain ideas are so dangerous, are so corrosive to democracy, that if we allow them to exist, if we allow them to spread on these networks, terrible things are going to happen to us. And those two ideas are very deeply in tension, right? That sort of notion of everyone should say what they want to say, and if you say that, maybe it you know, brings up the rise of fascism again. That's a really interesting tension between the two. This idea isn't new. Uh, my friend and sometimes nemesis Evgeny Morozov has been making this case for almost 10 years now. Um, but it's now become quite mainstream. And in some ways, it's become mainstream because of the specter of manipulating elections. So when you have radical claims from a group like Cambridge Analytica that they are using social media to target parties in an election, this feels like manipulation in a very different way than we've seen previously. Um, certainly there's some truth 
to what's going on in this space. We've seen indictments in the United States going after uh, the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg for attempting to manipulate elections. There are some legitimate reasons to be concerned about the ways in which social media is being used around the world, not just in the United States, not just in the UK, very serious concerns in Brazil, in India, in Sri Lanka, in Myanmar. Part of what I've been trying to figure out, along with colleagues, is how seriously to take any of these claims. You've probably seen my friend Brendan Nyhan standing up and essentially saying, we are not sure that political advertising works, period. Never mind this sort of dark advertising where we come in and essentially say by hyper-targeting to you, we're able to persuade you in one fashion or another. Brendan's take on this would be we have no evidence that any of this works. Why should we worry about this? Um, my take on this in many cases is that all this advertising is built on top of web display ad advertising. As Dan pointed out, I have been unfortunately involved with this field since pretty much its inception. Uh, and we know it doesn't work. We know that web advertising um, has this tiny, tiny marginal success rate. So asking this question about whether political manipulation works through the same mechanisms is legitimate. What we do think may be happening is more along the lines of, as, as Dan mentioned, network propaganda. And this idea that somewhere within this ecosystem of professional news, online native news, social media, and citizen engagement, something may be going on, making certain types of propaganda powerful in ways that they haven't been previously. And so what I want to talk about today is, is two studies. The, the first, the network propaganda study, let me be very clear, this is not my study. Um, Yochai and his team use tools that I've been building for the last dozen years, but it's his research. And so I just want to be very clear on that. I'm co-author on one or two of the papers, but at the end of the day, it's very much out of his lab and his conclusions, and I, I actually differ with him in a couple of places, but I'll do my best to present that work. I also want to share some very recent work, and this is work that just came out a few weeks ago. This was work that my team conducted along with a team at Sciences Po in Paris, uh, led by Dominique Cardon, Bruno Patino, uh, Théophile Lenoir, and we just released this in France quite recently, and in many ways it's a replication of the Benkler study, but it comes out with some very different conclusions, and I think that'll be interesting. But the baseline behind all this work is this notion that we want people to start thinking about media the same way that um, environmental studies looks at complex environments. And so in many ways, what I want people to think about when we're studying this relationship between media and movements and political parties is to think of this in terms of food webs. What are these very broad, high-level dynamics in the relationship between these different parties? What do they get from each other? How do they support one another? How do they interact on a very high level? A web like this is probably not incredibly helpful in telling you what happens with a very specific, this leaf goes here to, to this animal. But it's useful from that sort of 40,000 foot view of when we're looking at that whole system, what's occurring. And so some of what I'll be talking about is gonna feel like huge generalizations, but in many cases we're able to sort of look at the data and make an argument that those generalizations make sense. The other implication of this is that as fascinating as spider monkeys might be, or you know, 40 million species of beetle, there's only so much you can get from studying one species. And to the extent that I wanna provoke you, it's that I wanna argue that if you're working primarily within one medium and sort of doing quantitative studies of just Facebook or just Twitter, um, you're probably missing some of these larger ecosystem dynamics because there's all of these different 
pieces of this ecosystem that are related to one another. And we need spider monkey specialists, we really do, but we also need them in dialogue with the people who are doing the larger ecosystem work. So that, that's the frame for this. Here's a model that I've been using to try to explain to my friends in the journalism community a little bit of what I think is happening with the contemporary media ecosystem. So if you're a journalist, you're used to this world in which a small number of people are producing information, they control the means of distribution, right? They have the printing press, they have the trucks that deliver the papers out, and at the end of the day there is an audience who consumes the press, and to a certain extent we don't even care what they do with it. We just want them to keep buying it and keep doing it, and as long as we control the first two pieces of the chain, it's all good, we're gonna keep working in that direction. Obviously in this field, we wouldn't care about this unless that audience was also citizens, right? And so we assume that part of the role of press is that we are somehow preparing citizens to take action in the world in one fashion or another. Maybe citizens are gonna vote, Maybe they're going to express preferences uh, as consumers. Maybe they're going to form a movement. They're going to march. They're going to boycott. One way or another, they're essentially recipients of a media narrative, and we hope that they're going to go off and do something in the world. This model makes no sense anymore. Here's a model that might make slightly more sense. So production in this model is much more complicated. Some of this production comes from formal media organizations that have reporters and newsrooms. Some of this production comes from individuals who are writing blogs. Some of this production comes from propagandists who are putting forward content to support a particular point of view. The production no longer has control over the distribution. And in fact, distribution is no longer an interesting question, right? So owning a newspaper and having the printing presses, having the trucks, that's a great deal of power. Owning the broadcast towers, being able to send it out to all the televisions, that's a great deal of power. The power now is in discovery, right? The web brings production costs functionally down to zero. Um, it's really not a big barrier to be able to get the word out there. What's very challenging is to get anyone to pay attention to you. And so all the power is now centralized within Google, within Facebook, within these giant brokers of attention. And they are the ones who are making the money. They are able to extract the value out of the ecosystem. The citizens, the people formerly known as the audience, are still receiving the data here but they've got a whole bunch of new powers that were not as clear in a broadcast model. Some of these dynamics were still present. In fact, this was uh, what was so useful about yesterday's keynote was a reminder that none of this is brand new. But these dynamics are so much clearer now than they were 30 or 40 years ago. So one thing that citizens can do is that they're continually influencing the discovery mechanisms. When we find a piece of content, when we find a piece of news that we think is interesting, we share it with our friends, we upvote it, we put it on Reddit, we tweet it out, that is all telling the discovery systems to pay more attention to it. And so this becomes a form of political influence. This is a form of political action, of taking a piece of content and trying to either amplify it or suppress it. And in fact, in many ways, it's becoming a dominant form of political action when you think about certain groups of people, particularly young people. We also have this possibility of producing new content. We can jump in and essentially say, that content that's being produced, I don't believe it, I'm going to counter it. Or I'm going to add to it, or I'm going to personalize it, I'm gonna somehow add to the dynamic and push it further, push it out there. So as citizens, we have all the tools that we used to have. We can go out, take action, vote, march, whatever, but we can also try to amplify or suppress the content. We can also create new content and bring it into the system. This sets up a couple of feedback loops, 
And anyone who's modeled complex systems knows that all you have to do is add a couple of feedback loops. And very, very quickly, systems are very, very difficult to model and figure out where they're going. And I think part of what's so difficult about this system is that we have feedback loops where content selectively goes viral and explodes really widely versus other content that doesn't get circulated very far. Trying to figure out how that happens, trying to figure out the implications of it ends up being very important. Let me just talk briefly about some implications of this system. This system may not be very good for us. We have folk like Tristan Harris out there talking about the danger of addiction out of these systems, arguing that because these systems are built around some of the same dynamics as casino gambling, they're basically designed to be addictive, to try to keep us clicking, to try to keep us being part of it. And we should explore that. I don't think that's very well established, but I think it's absolutely worth talking about. Something that actually is very well established is that these systems are very dangerous for journalism in commercial journalism markets like the United States. In the US, where you're expected both to run serious news and turn a profit doing it, this system is really dangerous because that separation of production from distribution kills off most of the mainstream uh, media models associated with this. And this is an unsolved problem. This is leading to hyper-concentration in the market. There's a small number of press organizations that are surviving this. Lots and lots of essential press are falling out of the system. This is where I have a lot of fun. This is a system that is incredibly vulnerable to bad actors. And what I would say is bad actors are people who were not anticipated by the system, who are coming into the system and under false pretenses of one sort or another are manipulating it. So a couple of bad actors. Bots within a system like this are a very dangerous bad actor. They artificially inflate a signal. So if it looks like Dan's tweets about this conference aren't going to get much attention, he can hire a set of 100 bots, they retweet everything he says, suddenly Dan is the most important person in Italian media, and suddenly everyone's paying attention to Dan, and maybe Dan isn't the right person to pay attention to for Italian media. So it's an artificial signal, and this happens all the time. We know that this is, is coming into the system. Trolling and harassment is a really interesting form of bad acting in this. If we have people who are writing online, this is their contribution to citizenship, is that they are creating content within this. But trolls raise the cost by coming in and harassing them. This particularly happens to active, uh, activist women online. If there becomes a very high cost for speaking out online, you suppress that voice. That also breaks the system. Disinformation jumps into the system. It comes in through the same channel as legitimate information. If someone is creating misinfo, info designed to mislead people, it looks just the same as any other information produced, and it has the same dynamics with it. And then finally, dark advertising, coming in here and saying one thing to one audience, another thing to another audience, this comes in again through those discovery channels. I call these bad actors because for the most part, the people who run the platforms would agree that these are abuses of the system. Dark ads is a bit more questionable. You'll see people defending them. Certainly the other three are ones where most platform owners will agree that we're on the same side. We'd like to see less of this within the system. Known bugs are a trickier form of this. These are dynamics that seem to come out of this particular model that the platforms may not be as concerned about because they may just be built into it. The notion of echo chambers, the notion of polarization, mob behavior within these systems, uh, the fact that these systems seem to be particularly vulnerable to conspiracy theories, that they seem to do particularly well within this amplification loop. The fact that you need algorithmic filtering, that you need heavy moderation to make this work, these seem simply to be costs associated with this particular model. So this is the model that we are essentially using to sort of underlie this case study research looking at both US and French media ecosystems. It's a model that at its heart it's trying to figure out the relationship between three fairly blurry categories, right? News media at this point 
isn't just official New York Times, BBC news media. News media might be any number of citizen-created sources. Social media and news media, that's become a very blurry line. It's not entirely clear. Should blogs be considered news media? Should they be considered social media? I would put them somewhere in the continuum. Um, you know, what happens when you have an official page on Facebook? I don't know. It's somewhere within a continuum. And as I was arguing, civic participation in many cases is online participation. It's creating new original content for this. So this is a very blurry triangle, but it's a useful conceptual model to figure out what you want to study within the space. So the tool that we've been using to study sort of that news media, social media access is called Media Cloud. We've been building Media Cloud for about 11 years. It is free, and free as in beer and free as in speech, right? So you can download it. It's over on GitHub. You can build it yourself if you want to do it. I beg you not to, because the much better way to use it is just to use our version of the system, which has 10 years of data in it. Um, but you can use it. There is no cost associated with it. You can sign up for it now. What it is good for is it's basically LexisNexis designed for researchers and oriented towards the open web. So we have been for about 10 years now collecting roughly 50,000 news sources. So everything on the BBC, everything on the New York Times, everything on CNN. It's very strong in English speaking nations. It is increasingly strong as researchers come on and help us build collections for other nations. So I had a master's student come in and build a Brazilian collection, and it's really good at Brazilian media now. Um, and if you're looking at this and saying, I'd really like Albania to be in there, you just need to come work with us. We'll build up an Albanian collection. You can study Albania at that point. For the collections where we go back, we can often get back 10 years into history. And what that lets us do is go in and look at something like a fast-breaking story like the shooting in Christchurch, New Zealand, and figure out overall attention to the phenomenon, how it's being reported in different media outlets. We can do different bag of words approaches to see what language is associated within it. Um, so we are able to do comparative search, which turns out to be very, very helpful, um, to be able to sort of say, here's the overall phenomenon, here's the phenomenon of the specific shooter. Part of what's great about this is it's really, really fast and it's really live. So we were able to analyze a week's worth of data after the New Zealand shooting to try to figure out a very simple question. What newspapers publish the name of Brendan Tarrant, the shooter? And we were able to show that US and New Zealand newspapers largely did not print the shooter's name. UK newspapers had an entirely different pattern uh, and, and printed the name and quite a few details about it. We were able to do that with a week's worth of data, three days of analysis, and we were out 10 days after the shooting uh, in Columbia Journalism Review. So part of what this tool is really helpful for is being able to get rid of the data collection step of the work that you're doing because we've done the data collection and it's there and you should use it. So th this is the hard sell part of the pitch. Um, we're up to about a billion media stories. It has a very large collection of US political media and blogs, as well as US newspapers. It's quite good on the UK. It's spottier on different countries, but you can join in and give us a list of media that you want to be tracking, and we'll simply track it for you forward. Once you have it, we can do word frequencies and associations. We do in-links and out-links. We also have the ability to do a lot of social sharing data, actually quite analogous to what you might do with something like Social Science One. And unlike Facebook, we won't make you sign any miserable agreements. So this is what we ended up using for something like the network propaganda Work. So the network propaganda book is built on the Media Cloud database with a little bit of other data besides it. What network propaganda did was essentially say, let's look at all the data we can find that appears to be about the US election in a set of top thousand or so US media 
over the course of April uh, 2015, so to the beginning of the election cycle, um, through the beginning of 2018. Uh, and the work is ongoing, there's going to be a revision to it, but this is basically a snapshot of sort of a year and a half before the election to about a year after the election. It starts by looking for all of the news stories detected within the media cloud set. That ends up being about four million stories. It then goes out and does things like a link analysis, who links to whom. It also looks at how those different sites have been shared on Twitter and Facebook. And then it's able to do some very clever things as far as co-citation to generate networks around it. It's a deeply mixed method study. I'm going to try to give a very quick summary of what is at that point a 480 page book. And also to be clear, not my 480 page book. So I am now firmly in the realm of representing someone else's research. This is at the very top level what the link network looks like. And it's hard to make any sense of, so we're going to zoom in and simplify a little bit. This is the top 100 media um, as represented during the US elections. And what you'll see is it's coded color-wise. Um, so that deep blue is far left, that lighter blue is center left, um, green is center, uh, the pink is center right, and the deep red is far right. Now the way that this is figured out is not any content coding. This is a way of coding by looking at Twitter citation. So you look at a set of people on Twitter, if they are retweeting Trump, you code them right, and then you look to see what other media they are retweeting. If they're retweeting Clinton or Sanders, you code them left, you look to see what they're tweeting. This sounds ludicrous, I know this sounds totally absurd. It actually turns out to give you a very rigorous ordering of media. One of the ways that they were able to check against this is they did their whole ordering of media from left to right. They checked it against a Facebook set of media with people who had stated their political affiliations. They found R square equals 0.96. Um, so it's pretty rigorous as far as social science goes. It's a nice method for trying to figure this out, although it really helps to be during an election to get people to sort of state their preference. What you'll see in this in the link network is that there's a fairly healthy center. It's not as influential as the center left with things like the New York Times as the Washington Post. The right, um, one of the, the key things you'll notice, and this will be a theme throughout, is that the center right seems to be disappearing. It's not nearly as strong as the center left. There's a much stronger right. So here is um, how this network has evolved from 2015 to 2017. You'll see that the center right has shrunken even further. The far right has sort of moved out a little bit further. Here's a different way of looking at this. Here's the network, not by links, but by Twitter co-citation. So what's going on here is, again, the coding is by co-mention. If you mention Trump, if you mention Clinton, we code the colors that way. But now we're clustering by co-citation. And now you see the networks really start to spread apart. And if you get into the top 100, you see just a flat out breakage of the two. First of all, when you're looking in the top 100, you essentially have no more center right. And this would be one of Yochai's big conclusions from this. The center right in US politics has disappeared. Um, the right has moved much, much further to the right. It has very little to do in terms of a shared media or conceptual universe with the rest of from the far left all the way to essentially the center right. That is what you might think of as the reality-based consensus and then there is now a far right media sphere that has almost nothing to do with it. And there's very, over, very little overlap between the two. Um, very strange things start to happen within this. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, which is notoriously a right-leaning newspaper, shows up as center. Uh, within this analysis. Um, things that show up as center-right are things like RT. Um, so, uh, you know, really news sources that no one would think of as sort of representing the center. The right is so far right um, that there's really no overlap at all with the rest of the media universe. Here's another way of looking at this. This is looking at all the media within the set. It's ordered from left to right. And then the vertical 
is how often it's showing up on Twitter. So something like CNN, the New York Times, showing up very often with the Washington Post over there. The Hill shows up as center. That's basically a site for political junkies. You see nothing at all in the center right. And then over on the far right, you see Breitbart at the very top, Fox News sort of coming in below it. This sort of asymmetric polarization is Yochai's biggest conclusion coming out of this set. His argument essentially is that you have a normal distribution of media from the far left to the center right, and then you have this weird asymptotic spike going over in the far right. And he sees this as essentially a loss of common ground, a loss of consensus, a loss of shared reality between the two. This is echoed in a really interesting way by a piece of research that just came out from the Manifesto project. So this is just completely different data. This is actually hand coding of words in party manifestos, but it tells a very similar story. What the Manifesto project ends up saying is when you look at the language being used by the Democratic Party manifesto in the United States, the Democratic Party is a centrist party. In fact, it is almost as central as you can get in sort of European party terms. The Republican Party is functionally a far-right ultranationalist party. Um, by many measures, the contemporary Republican Party in the United States is as far-right as UKIP, if not further. So this is really interesting for us because these are totally different methods. We are not looking at language at all of party statements, but we're coming to a very similar conclusion to someone who's looking at the manifesto. So this is starting to suggest that there may be something going on as far as sort of common ground around this. So what does this mean? When we look at this potential split, what does this mean for the narratives that happened during the 2016 election? Well, so the first thing is this is a study that comes from Gallup. This is a text study. It echoes quite a bit what we ended up seeing in doing the media analysis on this. When people talked about Trump in red, they talked about a wide variety of things. They talked quite a bit about immigration, which is the main um, thing that comes out of this. They talk about Obama. In many ways, it's a reactionary campaign against Obama. Mexico, as Trump's um, biggest bugaboo sort of comes out. When we talk about Clinton, email, foundation. These are key words in scandal narratives that plagued the Clinton campaign. And within the Benkler analysis, this is very much what we found. These were the top subjects that came up. And in this case, what we're doing is retrieving all the text from all the stories, running them against topic models that we've built. And these are the topics that end up coming up. The dark blue are scandals associated with the Clinton administration. The Clinton Foundation, Clinton email, Clinton and Benghazi. The substantive Clinton policies are those lighter blue bars. Clinton on trade, on immigration, on jobs. They're some of the smallest bars up there. For Trump, you get Trump on jobs, immigration. That's the second highest bar there. So that's a substantive bar for Trump and then on trade. And then those bars in red are Trump scandals. Uh, so there are taxes, women, Trump University, Trump Foundation, Trump Russia. We actually had to chop this off. There's too many Trump scandals to fit on one slide. But they got very little attention in comparison. Uh, and this is one of the interesting things. One of the things the right has figured out how to do within American media is play on this notion of false balance. And so every time you would see reporting about Trump scandals, you would see within the sort of social sphere, why aren't you talking about her emails? Why aren't you talking about the Clinton Foundation? And you would see this center left press rush in to try to be fair, to try to be balanced. Despite the fact that the right is now living in its own information universe, you see this desperate effort from center left press to pull them back in and to try to have a coherent ideological frame. And what it does is it radically steers the narrative. It steers the narrative towards Clinton scandals and away from substance within this.
So we conclude from a chart like this that it's not Russia, it's not you know uh, election hacking, it's the New York Times. It's mainstream US media moving over to cover um, these scandals that has an enormous amount to do with this. There's another interesting thing that comes out of this. This is coverage of immigration. And Breitbart, which is this far right site that has really figured out how to crack the code. Breitbart functions as this bridge between, to use a technical term, the wacko sphere, the, the folks who are way out in conspiracy theory land and legitimate press. Breitbart has figured out how to write about conspiracy theories in a way that they end up getting covered legitimately. And it's this fascinating example of sort of upcycling. So I had a very personal experience with this. I wrote a piece in 2016 calling for the idea of public social media. Uh, and someone on the far right wrote a story saying Soros's top thug recommends nationalization of Facebook to silence right-wing voices. Now, okay, uh, I have worked for Soros. I've actually been on the board of Open Society Foundation. Whether or not I'm a thug is, is more of a, a, an interpretation. Um, by the time that article makes it up through the Daily Caller and into Breitbart, it is top Soros associate advocates public social media as counterweight to right-wing voices. Now that's close enough to true that it can actually find its way within the legitimate media narrative. So that upcycling process turns out to be incredibly effective here. And what happens is Breitbart is the one space within right-wing media that is pushing a consistent anti-immigration agenda. For the Republican Party in the United States, in the long term, immigration is a losing issue. The US will be majority minority in 15 years. It is coming really, really soon. The Republican Party cannot survive as a white nationalist party. However, there are folk within the right in the US who believe very, very strongly that anti-immigration is a critical part of that political identity. And they are best represented by Breitbart. And functionally, Breitbart takes over Fox News and then through Fox News takes over the Republican Party and takes over the United States. And that's the narrative that Benkler et al. sort of come up with here. And they're able to show this in part by walking through attention to different moments within the migration cycle, looking at the incredibly heavy coverage from Breitbart, how it leads it, and then we hit a certain point where the main response to immigration is this sort of angry counter reaction. Wait, why are we no longer allowing in students from Iran? And then you actually see Breitbart fade and other narratives sort of come into play. So the key takeaways from this are asymmetric polarization, this idea that social media may be at its strongest amplifying traditional media. An enormous amount of what happens on social media is the amplification and the spread of traditional media narratives. Not all of these are traditional media in the sense of being CNN, BBC, but in the sense of being something that purports to be news is being spread out there. There's a huge section of the book that looks at this question of Russian interference and essentially says, no, it's opportunistic, it's pretty modest, it comes in around the edges, it is charismatic megafauna. You know, we like looking at it because it's really exciting and really interesting to pay attention to, but it is not as important to the ecosystem as many of the other dynamics. They're not as worried about explicit misinfo or disinfo, right? The Macedonian style, let's make something up and put it up there. What they're much more worried about is that Breitbart stuff that essentially takes a roughly true story. Yes, I am advocating for changes to Facebook. Yes, I have worked with George Soros. But that gets spun into a way that turns it into malinformation. And the book in many ways looks very thoroughly at how malinformation finds its way in through this. And then essentially what it ends up saying is that the right wing 
is particularly vulnerable to some of these propaganda cycles. They put forward this model, which essentially says, you hope that media is connecting politicians, media, and the public through a system of fact checking, where you're competing for scoops, but you're counterbalanced by the fact that if you get it wrong, everyone else is gonna call you out. And so you have an incentive to be accurate, you have an incentive to get it right, otherwise there's all sorts of dynamics that are gonna punish you. They contrast this to a propaganda feedback, which essentially says that what you're looking for is identity confirmation. And you're no longer rewarded for getting it right, you're rewarded for making people feel good. Or maybe more to the point, making people feel angry. You're rewarded for making people feel. So it's an emotional system in which what you're trying to do is confirm someone's view of the world, and any time you disconfirm it, particularly through something like a fact check, you're punished by it. So they identify this, they come up and they look at a world that is essentially splitting apart this way, right? The left, the center left, even the center right are part of one universe, the far right has become its own universe, that gap may look sort of unbridgeable. So we then looked at this with the team over at Sciences Po, and we tried to figure out it's the same thing happening in France. Because you might expect that with the same dynamics going on, you would see a similar pattern. And in fact, you can look in French online media, you can find the same set of conspiratorial media, you can ask these questions about whether the same dynamics are at work. We ran many of the same experiments and we found something totally different. What we found instead is French media coming apart from the top and the bottom. And I'll explain that in a moment. But what we found was actually very little left-right polarization, enormous, enormous gaps between elite and non-elite media. So here's how we did it. We very similarly looked at a huge set of French media in part starting by listing media sources we knew about, in part by looking at who they linked to. We document a link network, and we end up with a set of highly central media within this, which we end up calling the hypercenter. This set of media is essentially setting the agenda for the rest of France. And what's interesting about this hypercenter is that it's very hard to pull apart left and right. You actually have right-leaning as well as left-leaning papers within this hypercenter. But they're the papers that you've heard of. It's everything, you know, it's Le Monde, it's Liberation, it's, it's the main daily newspapers as well as the main broadcast news. It's very much Parisian. It's very much centered on the federal level. It's not necessarily paying a lot of attention to what's going on at local levels, but it has very rich interlinking between left and right, which is extremely different than what we're seeing in a US context. We also started laying over this Twitter networks. So this is Twitter co-citation. So the network graph that's in it is a link network. And then those dotted line boxes are basically looking at who is co-citing. And when we overlay those networks, we're able to find roughly four areas. That's sort of a hypercenter and a group of media around it that we end up calling the core. They get cited very widely all over the ideological spectrum. There's a center left group. It intersects with part of that core media. It also has sort of left wing partisan media associated with it. Then we have two other sets. We have sort of what you might think of, I, I believe we call it in the paper, the counter-informational space. Um, I'll call it the conspiracy theorists. It, it's the stuff that's pretty wacky, it's pretty far out there, it's the French equivalent of Infowars. And then you see far right, uh, which is actually quite a bit separate from that. They're adjacent, but they're not directly together. What's sort of interesting about this, once you sort of group them at a very high level, we offered sort of a four level group. The core is that group that sets the agenda. It's those national dailies, the news magazines, TV and radio. There's a ring which is basically left and right partisan media. And what the ring does is essentially comments on the core. They link into the core, the core very rarely links out to them. There's a satellite of sort of alternative information space. This has the far right, it has conspiratorial media, 
you can look at it as being essentially anti-elite. It's often pointing both to the core and to the ring, but always critically, essentially saying, here is the media that's not listening to you, it's not paying attention to you. And then finally, there's a set of media that just aren't really part of this dialogue. For me as an American, part of what's fascinating is that local media fits within this. In the US, local media has sort of a very clear path towards the central media. You start writing for a local newspaper and three years later you might be writing for the New York Times. That happens all the time in the US. Doesn't happen in French media. Uh, and was really interesting to see how disconnected in many ways um, uh, French media within local areas is from, from the central media. So then we look at sort of linkage behind this. Everybody cites that core. Everybody cites that sort of hardcore of, of agenda setting media more than any other media in the space. The satellite, the sort of the folks really out on the fringe, they cite the core quite heavily. The favor is really never returned. So that establishment media, that sort of center of French media, over the whole course of this, we found fewer than 100 links out to the satellite media. One of the other interesting things is that Twitter is very heavily de uh, dominated by the core. Uh, we ended up finding that when we were looking at people mentioning media in tweets, there's a small amount coming out of that satellite media, there's a small group that's commenting on political media, but the vast majority are talking about the core, and the center of roughly 20 media outlets is responsible for 58% of the tweets that we found in the entire set. So we then went and did some of the similar content analysis. So with Media Cloud, we would go through sort our whole corpus of all the stories that had come out from the French media set over the period of time we were looking for, and then look to see where they were talked about in different corners of the media. So Parcoursup is a story about how uh, the French higher educational system is changing. It's a change in the entrance exams. And what's interesting here is it's covered by the left. It's covered by almost nobody else, um, but this is the sort of classic leftist elite story. You can see that it resonates for one group, it shows up almost nowhere else. Migrants, which has become a pretty strong story across the French media, shows up exactly where you think it would. Those big peaks are around right-wing media, around the counter-information or conspiracy space, uh, around the far right. Uh, my friend George shows up uh, in uh, the counter-information and conspiracy space, the far right space. So this is a nice confirmation that we probably have the basic sets of media right as far as we're sort of looking at them. The stories spike in the places that we would expect to. But then things get very complicated with the Gilles Jean. So as we were wrapping up this study, as we were sort of finishing mapping French media as a whole, the Gilets Jaunes protests became sort of the dominant news story. And part of what was so interesting about this was that they did not register nearly as strongly within the core media as they did within other forms of media. So they registered quite strongly on the left and on the right. The conspiratorial media, the far right media, all of them paid attention to it, but actually it's the far left that proportionally pays the most attention to it. This is the case of the mainstream elite media not paying very heavy attention to a story, but everything else in the media ecosystem paying attention to it. These graphs now do something that's quite fun to do with Media Cloud. They cluster all of the stories about Guy Jean based on similarities of language. So you take every story, you treat it as a bag of words. If they have the same words in common, you put them close to each other in the graph. You essentially end up with a graph of what language is associated with the stories. And then you go in and you hand code it. And so we're able to sort of say, look, here's a conversation here about local issues, the blockages of roundabouts, the demonstrations outside of Paris. Then there's one about demonstrations within Paris. There's a conversation up in that right corner about how this is policed. Um, Facebook as a movement within Guy Jean shows up in the, in the middle of this whole graph. 
what does this mean for political parties? What does this mean for Macron? And then up in top left, pay special attention to that. Those are conversations about what is the movement all about? What is the movement actually trying to do? What do the Gilets Jaunes want? You look at local media, and we would argue that they're pretty conservative. They're really just doing just the facts. They report enormously on those roundabout blockages. They do a lot of news reportings about the demonstration. That cluster near the top is about the justice system, essentially what happens to people who are arrested, what happens as far as uh, justice within this. When you look at the hypercenter, when you look at those real establishment media forces, there's coverage across the board, but it's probably strongest in those areas of political parties and Macron. What you're really getting out of the mainstream media is what does Gilets Jaunes mean for the French political system? What is this going to mean for electoral politics? How are the parties going to react to this? When you look at that ring and satellite media, the people who are sort of commenting on whatever else is going on, they all light up around the values. So this is the part of the media that is trying to take the values of the movement seriously. They're talking about what's the intention of the movement. They're much less interested in what this means for Macron, much less interested in what this means for the political party. They're really interested in what the movement itself is about. And so what we take away from this is an interesting potential danger that's happening within the French media ecosystem, which is that on the one hand, the French media ecosystem has done a very good job of firewalling itself from conspiracy media. It is not suffering in the same way that the US media ecosystem is, where stuff comes in through conspiracy theories, through Breitbart, through Fox News, and influences the agenda. It has firewalled that off. There is essentially a pact between left and right elite media that controls what we're going to talk about and is able to filter out some of the more absurd stuff out there. However, that may leave French media very vulnerable to missing stories like Gilets Jaunes. And in fact, we can see that the Paris media doesn't get Gilets Jaunes until the protests show up in Paris. They manage to ignore the local media stories, they manage to ignore what's going on in the blogosphere around this, and that blindness, that calcification, may mean that you end up with that elite media not capable of listening and paying attention to what's going on in that broader media dialogue. And so we came out worried about French media coming apart this way. We ended up saying we're actually worried about it coming apart this way. So these are just two studies, two really big studies. One's 480 pages. This one's about 120 pages. You can read it on the train back if you want to. But what I'm really trying to do is make the argument that we have to do work like this all over the world. It is a false assumption to believe that the dynamics associated with the US media ecosystem are gonna hold true everywhere else. We had thought we would demonstrate that France was going through the same cycle that the US was, but that was in perhaps an earlier state. That is not what we found. We found something entirely different. And it makes sense that we would find something entirely different, right? There is a much different relationship with the professional press in Paris. It's really, really different from how the press works in the US. You have a multipolar democracy rather than a bipolar democracy. It makes perfect sense that this ecosystem would work radically differently in France than it does in the US. My question now is how does it work in Germany? How does it work in China? How does it work in Italy? And I can't do all this work, which is why I need your help. And so one of the questions is, as we start doing this work, will we start finding some core dynamics that hold true, like the model that I'm positing as far as feedback loops, or will that model end up being threatened? Are there radical differences down to the point where these feedback loops between professional and citizen media don't hold true? Or do these loops simply manifest in very different ways based on the shape of politics, based on the shape of media? I don't know. Uh, but the reason that I find myself coming to events like this is with the hopes of trying to get folks like you to join the movement
of taking whatever work you're doing, taking, in many cases, highly qualitative work, taking work where you're spending a lot of time doing interviews and such, but asking you to also think about adding a quantitative component to it, because what we're trying to do is really lower the barrier to entry to do quant work to try to echo and support the qualitative work. I am a big believer at this point that there's really no excuse to not be doing mixed methods work. And my whole goal in this is to try to make mixed methods open to sort of everybody within the field. I am really happy to talk with you because I'm clearly here to try to recruit people uh, into working this sort of way. Um, but thank you so much for your time and for your attention. And that was only four shots of espresso. <laughs> Just imagine what happens when I finish this. Thanks, Ethan. Um, so we are now ready to take questions. Um, so please fire away. We've got a couple. We'll take three to begin with, and then we'll keep going after that. So. We're getting a microphone now. Sorry. Just a second. And I'm just taking notes here, so it's not like I'm answering my email. I'm just going to try, try to write down so, what you're saying. So this is my question is just about the stability of the structure that you that you found, and and how this information we not, uh, the French people, the American people, for example, knowing this structure could actually feedback loop into the and then the possibility of changing the structures in the future. Hi, thank you, Ethan. It was was great presentation. Um, very inspiring, actually. Also, um, I have I actually two questions. The first one is really really quick. It's about media cloud. If there is any plan to integrate social media feeds into it, or if it's only news media stories. Um, and then the second question is about the coding methods that you use to put uh, basically to locate uh, news uh, outlets on this K left to right. So. What, the interesting part of the story from the U.S. is that, of course, there is this gap. But I'm also wondering, so of course this is based on coding that is based on how people retweet. But how you actually label people is based on how you consider, or your manual coder consider politicians. So it's also based on how right you think Trump is. And the ma party manifesto project is also similar. So how right we think as coders, the, the Republican Party. So, do you think there is also that components that we, the coders, that mostly are left-leaning, I would say, are moving away from? So it's not that just they're moving on the right. It's simply us that are moving on the left, or and they're increasingly more finding them as, as really repellent and anti-democratic. So do you think there is an issue here? And if there is an issue, how do you actually solve it? It would just be great if people would give me their names as well, since I don't know everyone. Okay, I'm Nitan, I'm Andrea, University of Milan. Two quick uh, questions. So first, thank you for showing us that uh, fake news, uh, bots and so on are not so dramatic as uh, uh, discussed in the media. Uh, there is also a nice paper by Alcott and Jensko showing that fake news in the US was not that a problem. Uh, so normatively speaking, One, do you one of those rare moments that uh, Gensko and I actually agree on something. <laughs> okay, so um, normatively speaking, should we, as community, uh, scientific community, do our best in this moment to decrease the emphasis on this discussion on uh, traditional media and on the public debate. And the second question is about uh, um, media bias in the US, because the graph you shown from the, not your book, of course, uh, was not really a normal distribution, right? It was a concentration on the center left and a spike on the far right, uh, which doesn't ma probably matches the distribution of the audiences, that would be fine, but doesn't match probably a normal distribution of voters with a moderate mean. So if uh, there is a non-media consumer that is moderate, what can this guy do? All right, so that's three, by which I actually mean five. Um, so let's see what we can do with that. Um, OK, so the, the first question about stability of structures. Um, we have a little bit of that data coming out of um, the Bankler book, right? Because the Bankler book is looking at 
the stability of that graph pre and post Trump. And you would argue that that's actually one of the more transformative political moments for the United States, right? That's a, a fairly serious transformation where we have essentially an insurrectionist right candidate taking over politics. Um, so certainly in my lifetime, it's probably the most dramatic development within American politics. And you see the graphs change a little bit, right? You know, the right goes a little bit further out. Um, it's not a complete and total transformation. Now that's only one data point that we're working from. I will say on some other work that I've done, um, for instance, my work, the, the, the work that led to me to create Media Cloud, I started almost 15 years ago and that work was around um, how different nations are represented in US media. So, you know, at the end of the day, I, I study Africa, and I'm always interested in why Africa gets so little media attention. And those basic geographic patterns are essentially totally unchanged. You'll see occasional spikes, you know, the Haitian earthquake, Haiti suddenly becomes very important. But generally speaking, there's a return to the mean, and, and those patterns are quite stable. Will they remain stable over time? I don't know. Uh, and I would argue that this polarization was very much a conscious decision by people on the right to exploit certain dynamics and try to pull the media over um, to this very emotional, um, very fear-focused media. So I do think people are exploiting it. I do think these structures are more stable than you might imagine and actually require enormous amounts of effort to change. Uh, Francesco, um, thank you for the question on, on integrating social media feeds. There's two different ways that we integrate social media. Um, so the first is we have quite a bit of information about how URLs on the open web get shared on social media. So Media Cloud can take any URL and find out how it's been shared on Facebook over time, how it's been shared on Bitly over time, and that turns out to be very helpful. You can do a lot with that data. What we have been focused on is indexing media that isn't indexed by anybody else. So CrowdTangle has pretty good media, um, Crimson Hexagon has pretty good Twitter, we're not going after that in part because it's expensive, in part because we can't provide open access to it. The next thing we have done, and it's sort of available in early stages, is we partnered with PushShift, which has given us Reddit. So we now have Reddit going back 10 years. And so my students are working on a whole series of papers about Reddit, looking at how language is changing in US politics and seeing whether it changes in Reddit before it changes in mainstream media. So trying to sort of answer these questions about where extremism rises. Is it rising organically? Is it coming from political leaders? And then people are following those leaders. We're also gonna be bringing in Gab, AI, uh, which is a far-right platform. We're going to be bringing in 4chan and 8chan. I would not expect us to be bringing in Twitter and Facebook. Um, I think Facebook because it's really impossible for licensing reasons. Twitter because it's not possible for financial reasons. I will say that I think Twitter is going to get a lot easier to study thanks to some things that the Internet Archive is doing, and we're doing some work with them on making that more available. Um, on the coding piece of it, um, I, I think the problem you're looking for is not as severe as you think. So essentially we are coding based on people retweeting any of the right candidates and any of the left candidates. Unfortunately, the US is so clearly bipartisan, right? We really have no functional third parties. And to the extent that we have a third party like the Working Families Party, you can just put it as sort of far left Democrats. Um, it's pretty easy to sort of pull the two apart. And so when we're coding things as being amplified by the right, we're choosing everyone from Jeb Bush, who's a centrist, over to Trump, who's in the far right. So we're really not making ideological decisions. The only ideological decision we're making is does the candidate identify as left or right? If there were a blurring in the center, as there used to be in American politics, there would be a certain amount of discretion. That blurring hasn't been there for 20 years. The left is the left, the right is the right, and we're coding based on what people say.
this is much harder to do in other media spaces. You'll see Benkler et al. trying to do this in Germany in a forthcoming paper, and what they've been doing is very complicated math to deal with the multipolarity of it. You'll also see that we didn't try to do this in the French study because, again, the multipolarity is very, very complicated. We'll be interested to see how that plays out in other spaces. Um, Andrea, on, on this question of disinfo in public debate, um, I think my sense is that, and I'm only going to speak for the, for the U.S., and I think maybe it has some truth for the U.K. as well. I don't at all mean to speak for, for Europe or, or anywhere else. I think there's so much anxiety around the Trump election and around Brexit that people are simply looking for a simple villain to explain how we all lost our minds. And I think if disinfo was that simple villain, what's great about it is that you can kill it very simply. You can simply have better editors, you can turn the platforms into editors, they'll get rid of disinfo, and then we'll all behave rationally again. Um, I don't believe that's true. Uh, and by the way, I hate the implications of that. Right? The implications of that are deeply conservative. They basically say, we need much stronger press, much stronger editors, and maybe we need the platforms to act as editors, all of which is terrible, terrible direction to go in. So uh, no, I, I don't think that's true. I think we should fight the primacy of disinfo, but I think we should also understand that the reason people are falling for it as an explanation is it's a very satisfying and simple explanation. As far as this concentration of uh, media in the center left and the far right, yes, you're right. That's not a proper normal distribution. Um, it would be really cool if it was. It's not. Um, I think what you're really seeing there is some of the problems of media concentration. It's very hard in US media to make a living unless you're very big right now. So this whole world of media concentration has actually been very good for the New York Times and the Washington Post. Their subscription revenue has gone very, very high. It's been terrible for second tier newspapers. So Boston Globe, Baltimore Sun, Chicago Sun Tribune, all of those you know, very, very good newspapers, they've lost enormous amounts of influence. And my guess is that if we had the revenue problem solved, you would see a much more normal distribution from left to right at that point from those newspapers and from alternative media outlets. Instead, what I think you're seeing is financial hyper-concentration instead of brand expansion within that space. More? Yay. Thank you. I'm Anastasia Cavada from the University of Westminster. Thank you. That was very inspiring. Uh, you had me at ecosystem, so I'm, I'm sold. I'm sold. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, it seems you seem to be focusing very much on national ecosystems. And I was wondering, what is the place of international news media within that kind of ecosystem? And how can we see maybe a broader ecosystem growing across different regions? So maybe that's for future work, but I was interested to see what's going on here. Um, and also, with regards to the US, uh, I think uh, when you talk about asymmetric polarization and the role of the core sort of like center, center, left media into that, I was wondering what were, what were the implications for journalistic values? Because you seem to be saying that, well, you have this advocacy media on the center right, effectively, you know, and then you have uh, the center, centrist media trying to uphold to the, to the values of Western liberal you know, kind of uh, uh, journalism. But maybe there is a problem with balance there, you know, and what do you do with balance? So does it mean that, you know, that, for instance, with climate change, that's been this problem, right? So you talk about climate change, there is this consensus, but then you need to bring a climate change denier into the narrative in order to ensure balance. And I was wondering whether we need to rethink those kinds of values, what balance means in this uh, sense. Thank you. Uh, hi, I have also two questions. I'm uh, Azi, I'm from Israel. 
Um, first of all, I'd like to know a bit about how friendly your uh, system is, uh, following up on your, on, uh, your request for assistance, uh, to non-English, uh, non-Latin uh, languages, if there are uh, any complications there. And secondly, following up on Andrea's question, uh, you started by saying that um, this new ecosystem has a very modest uh, effect. On the other hand, from the graphs you show, it almost fo uh, forces people to focus on uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, uh, email server stories um, and overlooking uh, Trump's uh, many scandals. Uh, I guess this must have some kind of effect, so my question is what effect it does, if, if any. Hi, thank you for your speeches, it was very inspiring. And uh, I am Giada from the University of Rubino. And um, ju just about to spread yeah, the, the final sentence that you, um, yeah, you said in the end of, of this speech, uh, about to spread this work uh, on media uh, ecosystems all over the world. Actually, we try to um, apply the media partisan, partisanship potential score uh, in Italy to the Italian general election of, of 2018. And, <clears throat> uh, okay, you can find it on a couple of papers if you want to, to know about it. And I, I would like to know if you are uh, always working on that and if you are thinking to apply it to another yeah, to, I mean, uh, other elections like the middle terms one, or, or if you are trying to um, also to, to try to apply it to other countries, like more complex, like Italy, that is, uh, I mean, this very messy uh, multi-party system, so. Excellent. So we're going to take these three. I'm going to go in reverse order this time. Um, so Jada first. Um, so absolutely, the Bankler team is really interested in sort of replicating this work. Um, I think Germany is the first place that you'll see a paper out. I know that Italy is of very great interest to them. I would say that... Um, arrogant as we can be in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're all smart enough to know that we shouldn't be doing this work ourselves. I actually think the model that we, my team used with Sciences Po was a really nice model. So we had Dominique Cardon at um, the, the Media Lab at Sciences Po, who is a fantastic technical mind. We had Bruno Patino, who chairs the journalism department at Sciences Po. So we had great French journalism skill. We had great French social media skill. And then I was able to sort of bring some of the methodological work in. My hope is that for this work going forward, we'll try hybrid teams. And what I would say is um, we are not interested in publishing every paper in this space. So um, working with us, working using those methods, working using our, your own methods and having us review, uh, working on your own thing and putting it out there, explaining why we're doing it wrong, all of that is strongly, strongly encouraged. Um, I would say you should look closely at what Bankler is going to put out around multipolarity. Um, because he's had some very good network theorists working on the problem of how do you represent Italian politics, which just doesn't fit well on a left-right scale. How do you deal with a multi-dimensional scale? Uh, Ozzy, coming over to your questions, uh, Media Cloud is fully internationalized. It works very, very well with any alphabetic language. Uh, it should work fine for Hebrew. I know that it works well for Russian. We've done enormous amounts of work around Russian. Where it is problematic is Chinese. So it's tough for languages that don't have clear word boundaries. So if I'm dealing with Chinese, I have to first parse into words. And to do that, I actually have to have a highly functional language model. So in many ways, I have to be able to, to parse apart the words in the sentence to be able to analyze. We're working on that with Chinese partners. But for alphabetic languages, you should have no problem and there is some Israeli content already in there. Um, I would hope that if you take a look at it, 
and you find problems, work with us. There's a whole community and a mailing list of people trying to fix it. Um, we've done much more work on Arabic than we have uh, on Hebrew, uh, but we've already dealt with right to left, and it is a fully internationalized system. You're absolutely right. The effects are quite dramatic in the Benkler study. Where I am downplaying the effects is around the term disinformation. So here I'm going to fall back on Claire Wardle, right? Claire says disinformation is information that is wrong and you're propagating it out in the world. Misinformation is information that is wrong, you don't know that it's wrong, you're spreading it without thinking about it. Malinformation is information that might be right but has been weaponized. What Benkler would say is that malinformation was incredibly important in the 2016 elections. Something happened with Clinton's email. Was it relevant? No. Uh, but did it happen? Yeah. And so that was weaponized and used to incredible effect. It was malinformation, not disinformation. So that is the distinction that I would offer there. Disinformation, the pure, a bunch of Macedonian kids wrote this to make money, that stuff is irrelevant. Malinformation, which is information that has some basis in fact, but has been weaponized into propaganda, that's the dangerous stuff. That is where Yochai would come out on this. Anastasia, you're absolutely right to point out that these ecosystems cross national borders. One of the things that's been most interesting for me in studying US media is how influential British media is. Um, British media has a very specific role in US media, which is that it confirms a subset of far right um, plot lines. So what happens in the US is that our newspapers tend to be fairly responsible and our broadcast media tends to be fairly irresponsible. Uh, it's inverted in Britain, right? You have some very irresponsible newspapers, you have very responsible broadcast media. But, because Americans are used to taking newspapers seriously, they'll take the sun seriously. Um, so they'll take British tabloid press. And so British tabloid press becomes an interesting way of confirming certain far-right conspiracies that sort of come through. As far as your question, uh, so, but more generally, yeah, absolutely, we've got to consider it. I have to simplify the problem somehow to try to deal with national dynamics. And even in an ecosystem like Canada, right, where American media is enormously influential, it's still a minority share. Domestic media um, still has something like 80 to 90 percent attention in most countries, even in border countries where you're looking across the border at a much larger partner. So it's relevant, but it tends to have a specialized implication within it. As far as this question for journalistic values, yeah, false balance is exactly what American journalism is trying to deal with. Um, it has become such an effective weapon for the right to essentially say, look, you have to tell both sides of the story. But in some cases, you know, one side of the story is crazy uh, and, and manipulative. And it's really problematic because the center-left media believes in this idealized view in which the whole populace has a common set of facts and information. And that's just not the reality on the ground anymore. And I think in many ways what happens is we're still looking at an idealized view of American media from the 1960s and 1970s. And in fact, we probably need to return to understanding the media the way that it operated in the US in the late 1800s, which is it was highly partisan, highly contentious, and that you needed to know the partisanship of the different sources to navigate what reality actually was. So I think you're gonna see a generational shift around that, because I think you're gonna have to. Uh, I'm not thrilled about it. I'd love to see us go back to consensus reality, um, but I think it's very, very hard, hard to hold on to at this point. Hi. Uh, sorry. Uh, Marco Liz Harris from uh, Scuola Normale Superiore.
and yeah, I wanted to ask you a, a big question about, um, uh, are you familiar with the comparing media systems work of Allen and Mancini, uh, Mancini, which is an important taxonomy of media systems uh, starting 2004 analysis of Europe and then expanding uh, beyond uh, Western Europe and they uh, break down uh, the media systems along uh, four dimensions. The structure of media markets, what they call political parallelism, uh, professionalization of journalism and the role of the state in the media system. And I wanted to pause for a second on the political uh, parallelism uh, part which it analyzes the relationship between media and political parties and political organizations. And a subset of this analysis is the degree of what they call internal pluralism versus external pluralism within a media system. So internal pluralism is given when, say, the New York Times has a high degree of internal pluralism because it would cover the, e uh, the Clinton email as well as the Trump. Uh, scandals. But you could also make uh, the case that the media system is fairly democratic if it has a high degree of external pluralism, meaning as a whole the system deals with a diverse set of issues. And it seems to me that from your analysis, the New, the New York Times has this high degree of internal pluralism and that's why then you get the Clinton email which is very ha high because it adds up the far right to, so the New York Times feels the need of reaching out to these islands, but the reverse does not apply. Uh, whereas, for example, in France, probably, uh, according to Alin and Mancini, in France you have actually a high degree of external pluralism because it's a highly polarized system. Um, but I was wondering whether these categories can still be useful nowadays because it seems to me that you, you know, within your approach is very network centric. So in a sense, audiences tend to drive the whole development. But if you go back to the political economy of media, the reason why the New York Times has a high degree of internal pluralism is that they have um, they, are an, uh, they are an advertising driven model in the traditional sense of the world. So they need to cater to a large audience. So when you look at Breitbart, what is their funding model, for example, right? What, what are they, of course, they're catering to a specific audience, right? But how does that relate to the structure of the media market? So I was wondering whether you could expand on the political economy of uh, the US media system. And I'll Got it, them. that's great. Let's take another question. Very long. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Endra Borbat from, uh, the University, from the Free University of Berlin and from the Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin. Um, thank you for this super interesting presentation. I had two questions, both related to the French case. Um, one is that you presented the overtime dynamic in, in the US case, but uh, much less in France, and I was just wondering how did it look before the 2017 presidential elections and after, uh, because you find um, relatively little partisanship um, and much more division along elite and non-elite lines, um, and I was just thinking maybe it changed or maybe it didn't, but I would be curious to see that. And the second uh, question, also related to the French case, is whether this message that social media acts as an amplifier of, of mainstream media outlets applies also to France, and if so, is it for the core media outlets or is it what you call the ring or also for the satellites? Thank you. Um. If I may, Ethan, thank you so much for your presentation. Simeona Petkova, Amsterdam School of International Business, but also Digital Methods Initiative, um, Richard Rogers student. Um, so yes to mixed methods, yes to overlaying uh, co-link analysis with Twitter data. Probably you've sold lots of methodological uh, issues with social media studies. However, um, in 2012-2013, we mapped the um, right, political right, far right, race in Europe. Um, and I do wake up at night and I think, God, um, did we contribute to strength, strengthening the position of bad actors? By um, meaning, didn't we facilitate in some way um, their um, visibility and make their network stronger? So uh, my question to you is, what are your ethical and moral considerations um, in respect to amplifying the visibility of bad actors? Because um, we do tend to think about counter-mapping as a sort of research intervention. 
However, uh, what if we actually strengthen their position and their visibility? Thank you. All right, we'll try these three in order as well. Um, so um, thank you for the, the, the very thoughtful question about taxonomies of media systems. I don't know the Mancini work. Um, it was a useful summary. I think I would say that um, some of those questions, including the role of the state, um, are probably much more useful in thinking about European media than they are in thinking about U.S. media. Uh, there, there is no role of the state in U.S. media. Our public media is essentially voluntary media. There's functionally no state funding. Um, and as far as those questions about political alignment, um, it's a very different case in, in the U.S. where there, there's, you know, the, the phenomenon of sort of explicit party press has, has not been in play for quite some time. Um, so I don't know to what degree that that system maps particularly well outside of Europe. You're right to say that the way that we're doing it is essentially an audience-centric mapping. I guess what I would suggest is don't think about it just in terms of audience. Think about audience as amplifier, because that's one of the big arguments that I'm making here. So a purely commercial logic doesn't help you. Um, what you're thinking about is not only what audiences are you reaching with the potential of advertising to them, but what audiences are you reaching with the potential of, of getting them to amplify you. This is essentially where the center-right has failed in the US. Um, some of it actually has to do with the fact that the Wall Street Journal was one of the first to put down a very heavy paywall. And so it's almost impossible to amplify the Wall Street Journal through social media means. It's fine for them. They're making plenty of money. They have a nice subscriber base. But it basically means that they've exited the role of mainstream influence because they're functionally unquotable. Um, and that's been true for some of the center-right media. Whereas the far right has essentially said, look, we want to live on top of those dynamics. We really want to live and die on those dynamics of being amplified. Uh, what's Breitbart's funding model? It's very much uh, an advertiser-driven model. They've figured out that there is a substantial and engaged far-right population. One of the most interesting things is that Breitbart, of course, has lost tremendous influence. And there have really been two things behind it. One is that Fox News has stepped into Breitbart's space and taken most of their advertisers. The second is that there's been a very organized boycott um, to try to get advertisers not to support Breitbart uh, through a project called Sleeping Giants, which has been enormously successful. Successful. Uh, I don't know. I want to think more about whether the model uh, that, that I thank you for pointing me to is helpful in all of this. And I think as we're doing these cross-comparative studies, it will be helpful to have different models that sort of line these things up. On the questions of time dynamics, um, we don't know what's happened in France. This is all very recent work. One of the reasons I'm out sort of recruiting at a conference like this is that until we start collecting data for a country, we can't go back in time with this system. So, you know, if we wanted to start studying Hungary, we would need to sit down and come up with a list of the thousand key publications, and we would have to do, as we say, rolling tape. We'd have to start studying them now, and then in a couple of months, we would be in a good position to look and see what's happening. I feel confident that Dominique will repeat this experiment in a year or two with the French media, and I certainly think you might see a shift in the next election, but we just don't have that sense at this point. As far as the question about social media and amplification, we do see social media amplify, but what we found in our study was that it disproportionately affected the core. So the media that already had very good share was the media that was getting widely amplified. We were not seeing much of the partisan or the fringe media benefiting from amplification. Now, that may have to do with the fact that we were studying Twitter, we weren't studying Facebook. Obviously, it's very difficult to study those dynamics on Facebook. But I do think I'm pretty comfortable with this argument that French media is still highly anchored. And that even if you're looking at that counter-information space, 
you are seeing a lot of that central information space, if only because that's what the counter information space is reacting to. I don't feel like there's a separate ecosystem in the same way. Um, to the question about uh, the morals and ethics on this, um, I will tell you, I spend a lot of time on this because my current research is, uh, it's called IHOP. It's the International Hate Observatory Project. And it's basically building on top of Media Cloud and starting to add in some of this media that is more associated with hate media. And obviously the danger there is anytime you do any reporting, how do you avoid doing recruitment in the process? Um, I don't think we are the primary cause. And as much as I wish that our research were highly influential, I don't know that people outside of rooms like this are really reading it. Um, when we wrote the four-page version of the Benkler research for the Columbia Journalism Review, Breitbart trumpeted the fact that they were the most important node within the ecosystem, but it's pretty clear that that's all they read of the release, right? So I don't know that they've been mining the 480-page book to sort of find the insights. The truth, I fear, is that um, I think there's a lot of people in the extremes of the media who are much better than we are at understanding these dynamics. They may not be as good at talking about them in systemic ways, but I think they have an intuitive understanding of these systems that's far superior to ours. Frankly, I think we as scholars are just catching up. So I think the work of revealing these systems and demonstrating a potential trap, right? You can think of the Benkler paper as essentially a warning to the New York Times, and it's a warning essentially saying, look, you have this really good internal diversity that may actually be hurting you at the moment, and maybe you need to lean more heavily on external diversity at this particular moment. Uh, I know that the French paper has been very influential within French media. We ended up, Dominique and I did an interview uh, with Liberation, and they were clearly shocked, surprised, dismayed, I would not be surprised to see an explicit sort of Facebook reporter coming up within some of those French elite systems in reaction to it. But I think we're still catching up to the extremist actors within this space. So I still think on balance, the work is worth doing. But I agree with you that it's important that we be thoughtful and cautious in how we do it. That's all we have time for. We've run over into the coffee break. Uh, I invite you to continue the conversation with Ethan during the coffee break and to thank him for a wonderful and inspiring talk. Thank you.